Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to go back and look at the CentOS replacement once again. Uh, if you want a refresher on what the requirements were originally, I have a video that I did back in December. I'll put a link and you can go and look at that if you wish. Uh, I'm going to pick up from that point and revise some of the requirements because of time constraints, because of the amount of time it's taken me to do this. So what does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to leave it on CentOS? No, it means those were new capabilities that I'm just not going to get done this year. I'll do them next year. So, yeah, that's the plan. So, anyway, let's talk about what, what's going on here right after this. All right. So, uh, what we're, the phase that we're in right now is to replace the CentOS 8. Actually, it's the current version of CentOS is 8.4. And this is a decision decision matrix as to here's the capabilities that I think I need, and then an analysis of those capabilities to see what the decision is going forward. And I did make a decision, and I will share that with you today. So the purpose of this is to create the matrix for what capabilities I'm looking for, uh, and then fill in the details for each potential candidate that may be used to replace CentOS. That is, how did they how did they answer the the capabilities area that I had specified, and uh, and then take a look at the results and then make a choice. And that's what this is all about. So the goals, as you remember from last time, I crossed out a few of these because they were they're hallucinations. They're not goals. Goals have to be measurable. And so that leaves me with, I need continuous integration. I need to increase the server utilization to 50%. I desire to migrate 25% of the cloud to the public cloud and desire to contain costs to achieve. You want a one, at least a one-to-one -one ratio. Most businesses would actually prefer that to be even higher. Like give me back to, uh, you know, double the value for every dollar I spend. But, you know, in reality, one-to-one -one, would be a good return on investment because at least you've recouped your money. Uh, at least in some, on average, that means that in some areas you're going to be ahead and some you're going to be behind. But the desired response uh, to server overcommitment within 60 seconds, that's what we want. That's what I want. So the requirements grouping for this, based on how those requirements shook out, was I need DevOps support. I need a distributed storage with the scale-out storage uh, along the way. Web app support, web services support, and AI. Web app and web services, those are not current needs for me because I have moved those apps already uh, over to my ARM-based platform. So... I don't need those to be handled. And the AI, I also moved over to an NVIDIA-based platform uh, using the Jetson architecture to do that. So don't need my servers to actually pick up that slack right now. So orchestration, containers, virtualization, security, compliance, those are going to be big issues going forward into this. As that, I'm sure they will be for you too. So some of the things that came out of this was I need a, a, the capability to do reproducible build support. Now, what does that mean? Reproducible build support means that for every application that I create and compile, that that binary is exactly the same, whether it goes out to Debian, whether it goes out to Ubuntu. Now, there, are, there is going to be differences between those builds if I were to cross over into a RHEL-based platform, for example. So, but I want the same thing there. So if I do the application development on RHEL, then I want the same thing to occur if I'm going to Rocky, if I'm going to Alma, if I'm, you know, those kinds of things. So that's reproducible build support that you get exactly what it is that you built initially, that there's no modification if I were to recompile those on RHEL or whether if I were to recompile them on Rocky. So just as an example, and then I need DevOps, I need uh, virtualization, I need containerization, I want orchestration. Now orchestration here means that I'm looking to orchestrate the containers. I don't really care about the virtualization so much because the virtualization for me is being transitioned. So 
Yeah, so I need scale up storage to be able to do this because I want to be able to share the environment. Now, there are two schools of thought. So you're really talking about orchestration and scale out. You're really talking about trying to get to a, a point where you have support potentially for high availability environments. But the approach that Linux takes is in, in the old days is you did high availability for each server. That is, you would put in, for every single server you wanted high availability for, the best result was to put in three total, the original, the backup, and then one that act as kind of a, a check to make sure that, oh, well, you know, anything can go wrong in high availability environments because you are syncing uh, those transactions from one box to another to keep them and in, in basically the same, but you could have an in-flight transaction that's been updated on the first server, but it doesn't make it to the second. So before when a failure occurs, and so that's what the third one's for. It's there to go. Oh, I vote that that's the server to go to because it's the one that has the most current transaction base. So anyway, it again, it's not perfect. It's a mitigation, uh, and when you're in a high availability environment. But today, we don't necessarily care. Well, we do care about the server environments, but not to the degree that we once did. Today, we we do more high availability with the application than we do with the server. So, yeah, in the old days, you yeah you did the server high availability. Now, does that mean that there's no no such thing as high availability with servers? Absolutely not. There still is. I'm just saying the focus today has shifted. That's all. So uh, yeah, the scale out storage goes with that because again, if if I have anything else like an NFS file system or a, or uh, an SMF an SMB file system, I have a single point of failure in my in my file systems that I can't I can't allow, and so you want scale out storage that allows you to have some degree of high of a high availability there as well. And again, those are usually deployed in threes. Same reason, same issues, just it's with the desk storage. So compile time buffer checks, what you're looking for there is making sure that your <laughs> that what you've allocated for memory stays within the bounds of your application because if it does drift out, then you could end up uh, in a problematic situation where you have a program that's scoping into another program's uh, space and reading data, and that, and of course that would then be that would be an operating system support thing, right? So that's not necessarily something that's done by the compiler. Now it can, but uh, yeah, I I need that 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 buffer check to make sure that that my program is staying inside of its bounds that I intended for it, not to allow it to drift out. Mandatory access controls, yeah. I mean that's a, a, a typical security. Um, it's a it's not an end all, but it is all as a tool in the box, right? It's another tool in the box. Software executable space protection, again, same thing. Uh, I don't. There's really two things that are going on here. One, I don't want uh, to allow data to be marked as executable and then have it run because that's how you could inject uh, malware into a server. Uh, by the same token, I want to be able to protect that software space that is marked as executable to prevent it from being modified so while it's in memory. So GR security was a thing um, years ago. It's still important, but unfortunately the company has now taken it off the open source market. It is a commercial product now. So people are kind of moving away from it um, simply because of that. There is still support for it, but it's optional today. Like RHEL and Rocky and Debian and Ubuntu, they have all pretty much said, you know, well, you can, uh, you can get it if you want it, but we're working on better ways to handle that situation. And so it's good that the distros have stepped up to do that. Uh, I th w yeah, so um, RS back is another level of, of, of security for application control. So um, one of the other things that probably should mention here is 
when we talk about things like GR security, there's a number of software things that are in there. And years ago, the in, not all Intel processors supported what was called the NX bit. And the NX bit is what's actually used to mark segments of memory so that they're marked as executable or not. So in order to, to be able to implement an environment that would allow that to happen in a software managed uh, time, uh, in a software management frame, there was a number of software packages that were developed and they were inserted into the Linux kernel. Generally, they're off by default, but you can turn them on. So yeah, I mean, if you need those things, you can. We'll talk about that more when we get to it. Reference architecture has not changed since the, the end because I'm looking at my reference architecture across all platforms, not saying that this needs to be supported on any single one. That would be, that would be stupid <laughs> to do that. So uh, this is the reference architecture for the whole, for the whole uh, data center. So what did I do to set this up? So I reinstalled all the distros. I went out and got the latest ISOs. I have been playing with them, as you know, and going through some of them and talking about what their capabilities are. So, yeah, some of them are 8.3, some of them are 8.4, some of them were beta, some of them weren't. So I just said, okay, I'm just going to go get a whole new set and I'll install those. I chose the server option, not the server GUI, like I did when I was demonstrating it to you because I don't care about a GUI. I don't want a GUI on my servers. I want them as, fall, as small as possible. Uh, Debian, I deselected the Debian desktop option during install. Now, generally, um, that will get rid of X as well. So basically, the system comes up in, in text-only mode. Uh, for Ubuntu, I chose the server ISO. And yeah, same thing there. It comes up in text mode. So let's talk about some of the background. So I went through and I, I, I borrowed some of this from Wikipedia, I will admit it, uh, but I updated the information because some of their stuff was really old. So I updated this based on Alma and Linux, CentOS, Debian, Oracle Linux, Red Attic Linux, and Rocky. So you might ask, well, what about X? What about Y? What about Z? We'll talk about those at the end. So the founders are listed in the first column. That would be who started the project, who's responsible for it now is the maintainer. And then the initial release where something was published that you could get your hands on. Uh, and then what is the current version that's stable? And you can see that uh, listed out here. Now I do have Oracle listed as 8.1, that's wrong. It should be 8.4. So my bad, I made a mistake. Uh, the security updates in years, this would be how long typically they're supported. Of course, uh, in most cases, there is like a, we, we do so many years, seven years, up to seven years where we actually do updates. And then after the last three years, we only do security updates. So, yeah. So it's in, then Debian, of course, they it's approximately every three years, they will release a, a new version of, of uh, the Debian uh, software. So, in fact, uh, the release candidate for 11 just came out a few days ago. So, yeah, they're pro I don't know how long that will take them to, to do their testing, but it's good that the release candidate is out now. So, uh, the release date for the most current release is listed there. And then distri software distribution commitment, that's kind of a contract that they are going to adhere to that release schedule. Um, so yeah, so you could now Debian of course has a, a little bit of uh, of leeway because one they don't write all the packages that go into their system of course and neither does some of the others, so it's kind of hard for them to go oh here's a firm date. Second, they want to make sure that it, it integrates with others, and nobody else does that. Only the only thing I'm aware of is Debian is the only one that really does it to that degree. Now, I know Ubuntu does extensive testing. I know RHEL does extensive testing, so don't get me wrong. I am not dissing those, those two organizations. Both of those are fine organizations. I do not know how Oracle does their, uh, their work. Uh, I'm, I just I don't know, so can't, can't speak to it. Uh, and some of the other background is where did it originally come from? Now, I, as I had, I'm just simplifying this. There are pieces, of course, that come from the Fedora repos as well. 
for Alma, CentOS, and, and Oracle Linux, and, and, and RHEL, and Rocky. So I'm not going to say uh, it's always pure RHEL. It isn't. Um, but for purposes of this discussion, just consider it RHEL. And then uh, Debian is, of course, based on, uh, originally was based on soft landing Linux. Uh, they get, they, yeah, they gather their uh, software in from all of the sources. So where it actually comes, I don't know. Debian d just puts things together. I mean, it, they don't draw from, uh, they don't, they don't draw from anything other than the community and then some work that they're doing internally. Uh, Ubuntu draws, of course, from Debian. So, yeah, as, as do a number of them, like Pop! OS draws from Ubuntu, which, you know, has Debian stuff in it. But the, the target audience, uh, all of them are server and desktop. Now, Debian has a special marker they call general purpose computing as well as server and desktop. So, uh, I left it the way they had described it, and I did the same with Ubuntu Server. They have theirs classified as General Server Desktop Supercomputer IBM Mainframe. And if you are from Ubuntu and I missed one, please let me know. Uh, uh, don't want to shortchange you uh, on any of the things that I'm presenting here. Cost, the only one that has a cost, of course, is Red Hat. They charge you for support. Uh, status, all of them are active at currently at the time I'm doing this video, but of course we all know CentOS will no longer be active at the end of December. Uh, as far as the default Linux kernel, uh, if they're, they're, most, of the, most, of the, most of them are binary blobs. Now, Debian does have some, uh, some special things that they do. They allow the blobs to be installed optionally, but they're built with Linux Libre tools. So, yeah. Uh, as far as the default file systems, all of the RHEL-based ones are XFS. And, of course, you, you have different options on how you do that. You can install XFS on top of LVM, and there's ButterFS that's available if you want to do that. Now, RHEL, <laughs> RHEL doesn't have ButterFS. They decommissioned it. So, But uh, Fedora does. So I don't know what the answer there is. That's a confusing thing. Uh, and Debian, of course, installs by default under EXT4. Uh, Ubuntu default uh, installs by default as EXT4 on the server. On the workstation, they install by default to ZFS. Um, what system in it? They're all system D, so that's a wash. Uh, the desktop environment, if you want that, and again, I don't recommend that for a server environment, but if you do, those are your choices. Uh, and really, the only one where you have uh, some vari some variation in the choices is Debian. The rest of them are GNOME, and then you would have to install whatever other environment that you want with it. So, uh, not uh, reproducible builds. We talked about that. That's the ability to have the software build out the same way, depending in using looking exactly the same on one platform versus another. And uh, and really, Debian is in progress. Ubuntu is also in progress, but um, yeah. So those two are basically the same. Uh, as far as DevOps, you now of course there's there there are more than that. Um, there, but the ones I was interested in is Ansible, Salt, Puppet, and Chef for my needs, and those all are supported. Uh, they may be third party. They may have older binaries that are in, in their existing repos as possible. <clears throat> Virtualization by large part KVM. And then uh, containerization Docker on in the RHEL world is on its way out. So <clears throat> Red Hat has dropped support for Docker. They're looking for, and the reason for that is it's basically Docker has not really kept up with the security uh, compliance issues. Maybe that's a harsh thing to say, but it's more of, uh, I think RHEL was looking for an OCI compliant uh, container. And so Podman is really where they're going. Of course, that's their technology. It looks like Docker. It acts like Docker, but it is not Docker. So, yeah. Um, Docker's still around. Uh, there is some support for uh, LXC in the RHEL world, like Rocky Linux has it. I believe RHEL also does. 
But if you want Lexi and LexD, you're going to have to go to a Debian or an Ubuntu-based uh, system. That, of course, is an Ubuntu product. Uh, but they have made their way back into Debian. Docker is still supported in Debian and Ubuntu, but I don't know for how long. Um, again, it's I'm I'm I don't I you know I'm not banking on it being there. Um, orchestration, OpenShift in in the RHEL and Kubernetes and RHEL environments that includes all of them, SetOS and all of those. Now, OpenShift you can install on Debian, but yeah, you you may run into some issues with it. <laughs> I have never tried it. Uh, generally, you usually see that on RHEL. I mean, it is a RHEL product. Uh, and then uh, for the scale out storage, you have Ceph and ClusterFS. BGFS only runs on RHEL. And the only places where I know they actually have, because it's built into the kernel. So um, the only places where I know it's actually running is in CentOS and RHEL. So that's the only ones I marked. Uh, compile time buffer checks, some, most of them are unknown. The only ones I know for sure are Debian and Ubuntu. Uh, mandatory access control, I'm listing, now that's not necessarily SE Linux, but uh, I'm listing that as the application support for it. And then you have AppArmor as well. Now, mandatory access controls, you, yeah, you could consider it more than that. And it usually has a lot more things that you add on top of it, but those are the, the things you would need as a baseline. Um, and that's all I'm saying. Uh, software, does that mean it's, it's you're done deal? You install SE Linux and App Armor and you're, or App Armor and you're done? No, no. Um, you need more than that. Uh, because what you're, you, what you're really trying to do here is that you're trying to shape the, the system so that a, a particular user or a, a class application of user has a specific view of the application and data that's on that system and even then you don't allow that user to execute applications that they have no business running or have no need to run and then same thing with data you don't display data to them that they don't need to see for example you probably would not want your uh, your payroll to, uh, information to be viewed by people that were in sales for example you might give them, you know, their personal view of it, but you certainly wouldn't give them a corporate view into it, um, for example. So software executable space protection. Now, that's NX. Uh, it is, it, it's implemented in hardware and in Intel. There is a, a, a version of that for AMD as well. It's called something else. It just escapes me at the moment what it is. But the software version is Exec Shield. That was written by Red Hat. And uh, there's also PAX, which is optional to install on Debian and Ubuntu. Uh, GR security and RS back, those are optional uh, things. I don't know whether I, I can recommend GR security anymore. I tend to like free and open source and not commercial. And I, it kind of bothers me a little bit that these companies are using the free and open source methodology to get software developed and then they reap the rewards by turning it commercial. Now, I did list the package numbers just doing straight word, uh, word counts uh, through the different package managing applications, whether it be YUM or DNF, but you cannot compare these apples to apples uh, from Alma Linux, for example, to Debian, to Ubuntu. They don't package things the same way. Some of them, uh, well, in particular Debian and Ubuntu, uh, they do um, a less coarse job and they do more uh, micro packaging uh, than uh, RHEL does. So looking at that, you might go, oh my goodness, they just don't have the same number of packages, do they? So, <laughs> and then the packages for EPL, uh, which would be the non-free software, those are, mm, those are generally not included initially on the RHEL platforms. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about some of the things I ran into with, with RHEL. Memory use, this would be right out of the box. I did an update, I brought it up, I just looked, uh, and I just used HTOP to do that. So this is the numbers I saw. I let it run for a little bit to kind of let it stabilize 
and to pick up the memory that it was going to need and use because some services take a while to start up. Uh, but yeah, you can see that we went anywhere from 103 meg all the way up to about 294 meg. So yeah, the winner on the top end was CentOS and the winner on the low end was Debian. Uh, disk use goes anywhere from um, 1.3 gigabyte up to 6.2 gigabyte. I don't know why Ubuntu server is taking so much disk. I would have to go through and analyze it as to, whoa, where's all that disk coming from? But uh, yeah, his footprint is definitely heavier, even though the GUI is not installed. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what's going on there, but it was pretty big. As far as my needs, I need x86-64 and ARM-64 support. And, um, yeah, I listed the ones. Now, I have tried to install CentOS on ARM-64 before and have had mixed results with that. So, yeah. Alma Linux is the only one that does not yet have a, a, a ISO file for, R, for ARM. Now, that doesn't mean you couldn't recompile it, but... The kernel generally on a sock is a little bit more challenging because you, you, yeah, you have, when you have a system on a chip, you have all your hardware there, not just, yeah, not, and you don't get any choices about that. You can't just go, well, that network card doesn't work. I think I'll go install this one. Um, you can do that to some degree depending upon what ARM processor you have, but you generally are stuck with what you get because most of the, as most of these SOCs behind me, they do not have any other way of doing it. So, all right. So what else, what other results did I look at that I didn't publish? So I did a file system benchmark on every one of the machine using IO zone. The results were not remarkable. They, they came out almost, a, almost to the point identical to what I would see versus on XFS versus EXT uh, 4 versus CFS. So, <laughs> Yeah, uh, no big surprises there. I've already published those results. If you want to see how well XFS performs against DXT4 or ZFS, be my guest. Go, I have uh, I have uh, videos that talk about that. Uh, I did I did run into some issues, so I did some dumb things just to see what would happen. Generally, this is a personal choice. It's not a right or wrong choice, but I generally do not do DNF upgrades from one minor release to another. Uh, and the reason for that is I usually want to run something in parallel because there have been times in the past where things have broken drastically going from one minor release to another. So uh, I generally do a separate install for 8.4, for example, when, and leave the 8.3 alone <laughs> until I'm certain that everything's working. Then I shut down uh, the 8.3. But in this case, I wanted to see what would happen. So I first did it on RHEL. Uh, I was on 8.3 and I just did a DNF update. It worked, but the, there was a difference. I mean, RHEL was installed as a server only install, so it was just text. Alma, however, was installed as a server with GUI, and so was Rocky. There almost showed no signs of any problems at all. It went through and it said it was all successful. But when I went to log in, it froze after entering the password. It didn't move, didn't go anywhere after that. So it just flat refused to log in. A Rocky showed a number of failures while the uh, DNF update was running. And it didn't even finish. It, it core dumped at the end. So I wasn't expecting good things from Rocky. It booted after the upgrade, but it would hit the same problem. It, it just refused to install. It, it refused to log in. So, yeah. Um, the other funny thing that happened on RHEL was <clears throat> it was used following their directions for installing the developer tools because I had to compile some of my, app, my benchmark applications because the packages were missing. So I went to do that, and RHEL went into this really weird thing where it deleted the subscription to their repos and turned off everything. So it deactivated uh, my uh, license. It's probably a bug, I'm guessing. But 
the I was I first started to try to in, to install using the developer tool group. I think it's called developer tools. It's a group, and then you would just install that. But those weren't there. I didn't find them. Uh, and now again, it could have been something to do with that update <laughs> going from 8.3 to 8.4. So I, yeah, I just, I just reinstalled RHEL and then everything was fine. I was able to get the development tools up and running just fine. And the, and the subscription stayed. So I'm guessing that it, it, its manifestation of that was different. So yeah, you can run into some problems when you're upgrading like that. Um, but anyway, I, I attempted to install Sysbench on RHEL first. It is in the, the repos. But it failed because the libraries, in some cases, were in conflict, which, yeah, you run into that occasionally with these systems. What am I going to do? So <laughs> I'm going to Debian. I'm going to Debian 1010, uh, and that I am going to install as a server. What's my justification? Why? Well, to be truthful, I no longer trust Red Hat. I no longer trust RHEL. With IBM in control of them, I mean, IBM makes decisions on a, on a dime. They don't consider their customer base. They will just, they'll, they'll just throw something out. And there's nothing, in, if you're a customer, you're stuck. So I don't trust them. And uh, yeah, so I have, and also it's, if I go into uh, to Debian, go into that branch, that simplifies my support for DevOps because if I'm doing updates or I'm doing installs of packages or I'm doing security compliance, I have to almost write a separate set of commands for RHEL versus Debian because they're just so divergent from one another. So yeah, I want to have a, a single use case for x86 and ARM and the only difference being one package is compiled for ARM and one of them is compiled, compiled for Intel or, or AMD. Um, the other the other thing I'm a little concerned about is I, I have this feeling that Red Hat is trying to control too much of the DevOps, containers, cloud, orchestration, etc. They have their own versions of software in that mix. What I'm kind of, you know, whenever that happens, it's it's always now I'm not accusing Red Hat of doing this at all, but I could see that it would happen. We're going to promote our stuff. And we're going to kick the other stuff off our platform. Now, they did do that with Docker, no question about it. But I think Docker probably is well deserved. It is just not getting updated as much, uh, especially in the security areas, to maintain its compliance. So it's a little, it's getting a little scary. So I don't blame them for dropping Docker, but I could see that happening with some of the other packages as well. Uh, I don't. Again, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know anything internally about what's going on in Red Hat, but uh, and if, if I'm wrong, please tell me. I would love to hear from you. Uh, I would love to hear from you. It's just an opinion. So, uh, cons. Support cycle is shorter. Uh, three years for Debian is much shorter than RHEL. So I will have to update more often. The good side of that is is that Debian does have a pretty good in-place upgrade. I mean... I have upgraded servers on Debian in the past, going from one version, one minor version to another. I even have upgraded major versions in place of Debian and had pretty good luck. Now, does that mean all the applications make it? No, they don't, but uh, yeah. The other problem is that there's uh, the security compliance software that you'll find under RHEL and the support for that security compliance software is not there. It's lacking in the Debian world. but I'm not in that. I'm not in that. I don't have that need so for my stuff anymore. So I'm fine. As far as pros, Debian stability and ease of access to development tools, much less trouble getting access to the development tools on Debian and Ubuntu too. Both of them are very easy to get that kind of stuff loaded. And in fact, a lot of times on Debian and Ubuntu, particularly with the workstation versions of the software, you they load a core set of development tools for you. And then, of course, if you need the the other stuff that goes around it, yeah, you can update that as well. Now, to be honest, Alma and Rocky Linux were great. They both have tool sets that are set up that will install everything. 
uh, that you might need, like bison and flax and all of those things, uh, in addition to make and the compilers as well. And in fact, I think it, even in some cases, they install a full suite of compilers, like Fortran and C++ and all those things are there as well. So to be fair, Rocky and Alma are doing a really good job of that as well. So, uh, uh, by the way, so does Oracle. Oracle also supports that model of using the tool sets. Red Hat, for some reason, doesn't. I don't know why. They just don't. <laughs> they have this group thing in their mind. I think that comes from the Fedora side of the house. But there's also support for LexD and Lexi, and I find that appealing because I do... I, I, my virtualization strategy does use LexD and Lexi. Um, do I need Podman support or Docker support? Yeah, I have some Docker, but I'm kind of migrating away. Um, the other thing is there's a smaller memory footprint, quite a bit smaller, in fact. And that means that there are less packages that are installed on Debian when you go to, to run it. It doesn't mean it'll stay that way. But it does mean that, I hey, I get a choice on what I want to run on that box. So uh, starting out, it's better to have less than more. And then you can decide what else you want to blow it out your system with. Uh, same thing with the disk footprint. And then the kernel images, of course, on the Debian Ubuntu side are more recent than they are in RHEL because of the longer time frames. Now, when you catch when RHEL catches up, like when, if they were to come out with 9, They'll catch up, and then they'll fall behind because their, yeah, their support cycle is longer. So why not? It's my, the why not? So I'm, I'm sure you guys will have a lot of questions. Why didn't you choose Arch? Well, Arch is a great, a great distro, don't get me wrong. But I don't want version instability in my, in my server environments. Sorry, I don't need to have things break because... There wasn't enough testing done to find out that those two packages don't work with each other anymore. So, yeah, I don't want to spend my time fixing problems. I mean, that's a great hobby if you want to learn Linux, but it's not a great hobby if you're trying to run a production server. Uh, why not BSD? Uh, in my, I, I'm a Linux channel, and so BSD is fine. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great operating environment. Don't, again, don't get me wrong. It has some really good security features. It has some really good ways of doing containerization. It's just not what I want to do for this channel. I'm not a free BSD channel. I'm not a BSD open BSD channel. I do review BSD because I use it still, but uh, yeah, it's not my focus on where I'm running my applications. Uh, and that's just a personal choice. It's not because I think it's awful. I don't. I don't think it's awful at all. Uh, and I can see a valid need for it, um, particularly if you're building a NAS or a file server or, or having uh, support for that kind of thing. Uh, or you want to run uh, containers which are secured. And, and you, have a, you have a better model under BSD for that than you do under Linux. I mean, let's be honest. So why not Ubuntu? That's a close call. I mean, I will probably will use some Ubuntu servers. I'm not saying I'm going to be exclusively uh, Debian. So, yeah, there's going to be times when <laughs> I'll be using both. So why not XYZ Distro? Why didn't you look at Gentoo? Why didn't you look at this? Uh, time, mostly. <laughs> but, yeah, mostly it's just time. I wanted to hit the ones that I know are used in the cloud environments already. So... So is this decision I made the right one for you? I, I don't know. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but maybe you can use this spreadsheet, and I'll put that out on, on um, my GitLab page for you. you. Maybe you can use that as a template for you to, one to build your own out with. But will I change my mind about where I'm going? Oh, yeah, it always happens. I mean, there's, and I'll share that to you when it happens. If, there's always a, a, a shiny object that will come along catch your attention and you'll go and install whatever operating system distro is needed to support it. So yeah, I'm sure that will happen. This isn't, there are no absolutes in IT except change. That is the only absolute I have ever known in IT is expect change. Anyway, <laughs> on that note, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed this today. Uh, 
that I've already started the migration, so I didn't really wait for all this. But uh, it is. It just took me a while to get there, and people kept some were kept uh, saying, "Hey, why don't you try this one? Why don't you try that one?" But you know, Braille has a lot of uh, a lot of, uh, of distributions that were fanned from it, and of course. Rel was in turn uh, at the end of another chain, like Yellow Dog fed quite a bit into Red Hat at one time, as well as a number of others. Even Mandriva fed into Red Hat at one time, a little bit. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. And if you did, please like and subscribe to my patrons. Again, once again, thank you so much for your support. I do appreciate it, and I appreciate all of you. Hope to see you again real soon, and, hope, and bye for now.